Welcome, my name is Stacy Loftus. I'm a staff scientist in the Genetic Disease Research Branch. I'm very thankful to be able to present this work today. Um, and it is work that we've done to identify hypoxia and hypoxia-inducible uh, factor one alpha targets and how we've used this uh, information to identify a molecular profile associated with poor melanoma prognosis. So this work uh, was awarded the Thomas B. Fitzpatrick Medal. Um, and this talk was originally to have been presented at this year's IPCC that was canceled this last June. Uh, it's an honor to have our work recognized by the editors of Pigment Cell and Melanoma Research as the best mm -hmm. original publication over the past three years in PCMR. Uh, this award was, it honors the memory of the late Thomas Fitzpatrick. And as many of you know, uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick established the Fitzpatrick phenotyping scale used to describe an individual skin type in relationship to UV exposure. He published Fitzpatrick's Dermatology in General Medicine, and he defined some of the early markers in melanoma. In doing so, he described the initial symptoms of the disease and encouraged early screening. This award is really truly an honor, not only as it's named for Dr. Fitzpatrick, but it's also an honor to be included um, in the list of other researchers that have received this award in recent years. So today's talk, I'm going to divide it into two sections. The first section, I'll go over data defining um, a melanocyte's response to hypoxia. And in the second half of the talk, uh, I'll be talking about a molecular profile that we've identified that's associated with poor melanoma prognosis. So in normal skin, melanocytes in humans reside at the dermal epidermal border. And it, this is a unique location because it's actually located within an oxygen gradient. Our dermis is really well vascularized. However, the epidermis is actually mildly hypoxic. And so the melanocyte is uniquely poised in this region and it is uh, also very capable of responding to hypoxia as I'll demonstrate today. We uh, tend to focus in melanoma on the genetic changes that drive uh, tumor progression. However, we also know that these mutations alone provide an incomplete understanding of melanoma metastasis. Um, and in fact, these cells and the mutations that they have are responding to microenvironmental signals that can change rapidly during tumor progression. As the tumors progress and proliferate, they can um, lose or have insufficient vascularization. And so they're not receiving oxygen, they're not receiving nutrients, and this can uh, result in localized regions of hypoxia. The cells respond to this hypoxic environment uh, with dramatic changes in gene expression. And together, it's these genetic alterations and the microenvironment which are uh, driving these distinct pathways that together come together and promote uh, metastasis in melanoma. So we wanted to understand hypoxia and HIF1 interacting factor, uh, hypoxia interacting factor one or HIF1 alpha is a key regulatory factor in a cell's response to hypoxia. And it's actually the protein stability of HIF1 alpha that's tightly regulated in response to oxygen concentrations. And so this allows the cell to rapidly change in response to its environment. So under high oxygen, uh, the top part of the slide here, uh, the prolines on HIF1 are hydroxylated. This allows von Hippel-Lindau uh, tumor suppressor protein to uh, bind to HIF1, and it starts a cascade by which HIF1 is then able to be uh, ubiquitinated and transferred to the proteasome, and then it's degraded. So under low oxygen concentrations or hypoxia, HIF1's far more stable and it's, it can then be translocated to the nucleus where it binds with other cofactors and uh, is able to uh, uh, derive expression for the HIF1 target genes. And in other tissues that people have studied HIF1, we know that the cellular response to HIF1 um, is across a large number of genes and a large number of cellular functions. So it really is this gatekeeper uh, response and shifting a cell's uh, gene expression profile very dramatically. 
We also know from these studies that HIF1 target genes vary immensely depending on tissue type. And so for us to really understand what's going on uh, in melanoma, we needed to make sure we were evaluating HIF1 target genes that were uh, targets in uh, melanocytes in melanoma. So this is our methodology that we're using. We decided to use mouse melanocyte, uh, melan immortalized uh, the melanin inc 4 a R cells. Our conditions of normoxia versus hypoxia. Hypoxia uh, is 1% oxygen uh, for 24 hours and compared to standard tissue culture conditions. And all of our uh, SI HIF1 alpha uh, knockdown experiments were done under the same uh, hypoxic conditions. And so knockdowns were done and then the cells were treated to 1% oxygen uh, for 24 hours. So we wanted to first characterize how the inc 4 uh, cells were uh, responding to hypoxia. So in 24 hours, we know that the melan A's show this increase in cell migration already. We know that uh, in 24 hours in our uh, SI control, we see this increased level of uh, protein for HIF1, and we don't see that in our SI uh, knockdowns. Uh, so not only is pro we have protein knockdown, we also wanted to go back and look at the messenger RNA levels. We see messenger RNA of HIF1 is actually knocked down. We see that uh, under hypoxia activation of HIF1, we see under our SI control, we see activation of HIF1 uh, for target genes. And then for other target genes for HIF1, we, we do not see that activation of those target genes because HIF1 is not able to, to activate those targets. So we felt that we had the response that we would expect. We wanted to, to, to more fully and more broadly to find the full uh, gene expression profile associated with hypoxia and melanocytes. Uh, we first did our moxie and hypoxia, and we identified 709 genes. And these are genes with altered expression greater than 1.5 fold. When we looked at our data set for control SIs versus our SI knockdowns, we found uh, 712 genes that were consistent. We wanted to evaluate what the upstream regulators were. Are we actually getting HIF targets as we would expect? And we were gratified to see that, yes, in fact, we do see uh, that the predicted HIF targets are contained within this data set. We also see, um, and the central column is the, the predictors that are in common between both. So we see STAT4 uh, being predicted in our knockdown experiments, but we see MYC being predicted as an upstream regulator in our hypoxia experiments. For those genes that are down-regulated in hypoxia and down-regulated in our control SI in comparison to the, to the HIF knockdowns, we saw um, E2F family members, we saw ATF4 with lower hypoxia, and we saw TBX2 emerging uh, in that data set that was present in both of the data sets. So we wanted to intersect both of these data sets and this led us to a list of 251 genes. Now these genes are HIF1 dependent genes and they also respond to hypoxia. So we have another set of HIF1 dependent genes that are hypoxia independent. And we have another set of hypoxia responsive genes that are unaltered in HIF1 but we wanted to focus on those 251 at the intersection. We just wanted to quickly do pathway analysis to confirm the molecular functions are, are what we expect. And we do see what we would expect, genes that are up in hypoxia, cell death and survival regulation and carbohydrate metabolism. And those that, have, uh, that are down-regulated with hypoxia, we see that those tend to be involved in DNA replication. Um, in combination and repair and in amino acid metabolism. So we wanted to be able to ask which of these 251 really are direct targets and are HIF1 uh, directly be based upon chromatin uh, regulation of those genes. So we did HIF1 chip and we did this in two biological replicates in those melanin inc 4 a cells again, we identified 1,773 peaks. We felt gratified that we see enriched in those peaks, the consensus motif uh, that's known for HIF-1. Um, and you may recognize this motif. This is actually five of the six base pairs for an EBOX consensus. Uh, 
we also wanted to just go through and verify that we were seeing binding at known HIF1 targets. So here I've just uh, showing the binding profile at the transcriptional start site in our replicates in comparison to our input control for the known target KDM3A. So there's more in here than just HIF motifs. So when we look more broadly at the 1,773 replicated peaks, we see several overrepresented motif profiles contained within subsets of these uh, binding peaks. So we definitely see a HIF aren't motif that is more broadly across uh, our peak summit. We see a dream identified motif that flanks our peak summit. Um, and this motif right here um, isn't correlated with any known protein to date. We also see enrichment for genes in several interesting pathways. We see enrichment um, right at where our, our peak summit for RFX3 motifs. And we see more broadly a peak uh, corresponding to the motif for NRF1. And I highlight the two of these because uh, recent publications for both of them uh, really speak to uh, our data and to hypoxia in general. And so RFX3 is a regulator of proteins involved in cilia formation and function. And recently RFX3 chip has been published and the authors of that paper highlight that they see enrichment in their data set of ARNT2 and which is HIF2 and MITF EBOX motifs. Interesting that we're, we're both seeing this enrichment uh, in each other's chip data sets. Um, the other one is NRF1. Uh, NRF1 is a master regulator of nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes. And recently it's been demonstrated that hypoxia promotes NRF1 degradation. So I'll uh, remind you that HIF1 also is regulated at the protein level by hy hypoxia. And it's interesting that we see this uh, interaction, between the, um, an opposing uh, interaction between HIF1 and NRF1. So whereas hypoxia stabilizes HIF1, hypoxia seems to degrade NRF1. So with our chip data set, we wanted to then go back and assign genes. We chose to assign genes based on transcriptional uh, transcriptional start site proximity and to take a very conservative approach. I'd like to highlight that we see chip binding not only at chip, uh, transcriptional start sites though, we see there and at distal regulatory regions. Um, we, wanted, we did want to take a very conservative approach for assigning genes, however, and so we selected only to evaluate the genes that were um, in close proximity to an a peak plus or minus 5 kb from a transcriptional start site. So this led us to a collection of 591 genes. And again, here I'm showing a pathway analysis that um, contained within these 591 genes absolutely are known HIF1 uh, targets. And they're also genes that are MYC targets and there are genes that are involved in regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So just a quick summary so far. Uh, I've shown you a little bit of our data about HIF binding occurring both at transcriptional start sites and distal regulatory regions, and that we do have the HIF-1 uh, alpha binding motif, and it is enriched within our HIF-1 peaks. We see additional motifs enriched, specifically RFX3 and NRF1, and uh, future work is going to need to be done to, to see whether it's coordinated binding possibly at these uh, regions, or is it just coordinated regulation of these genes. So now I'm going to shift gears, take those 591 genes and ask how does this correspond to our other two data sets? Where do those genes land? And again, we had a HIF1 dependent set of genes and a hypoxia responsive set of genes. When we intersected all three of these data sets, we see this distribution and that gave us 81 genes that were HIF1 direct targets that we wanted to use for further uh, evaluation. So these were our most robust um, set of genes in the data set. 
interestingly, half of these direct targets of those 81 were novel HIF-1 direct targets that had not been identified in other tissues previously. However, these genes did fall into those characteristic categories that we know HIF-1 is regulating, angiogenesis, mitochondrial function, immune response. In addition to several of the genes were um, identified to be important survival of other cancers, we also saw genes that were involved in ciliopathies, maybe giving a nod to the RFX3 data that we found. I'd also like to highlight uh, an, another paper that's come out um, more recently from uh, Glenn Marlino and Pravin Mishra. Um, they looked at uh, KDELR3 and they came at it from a melanoblast transcriptome based analysis and were able to identify that uh, KDELR3 is involved in, in tumor metastasis. So I think this is a really unique set of 81 genes uh, that are, is really is worthy of, of future evaluation uh, with respect to, um, to melanoma progression. So in summary, we've identified both HIF, using HIF1 trip, our SI HIF1 alpha and our hypoxia genes, the set of 81 very discrete genes, but more broadly, we have identified and characterized uh, the melanocytes response to HIF1 itself and to hypoxia separately. And I, I do wanna highlight that these genes that we're identifying are novel to the melanocyte lineage so far that they had not previously been identified as HIF1 targets. And this led us to really want to be able to say, are these genes associated with that progression from stage two to stage three tumors? And can this molecular profile be used uh, as a, a mechanism to assess uh, melanoma disease prognosis? So to do this, we utilized the data with, that was at the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA. We took advantage that they had a skin uh, cutaneous melanoma data set. It allowed us to inter uh, do evaluation of tumor pathology and make correlations with the gene expression that was in those tumors. TCGA um, has data for tumor thickness and ulceration. It also has lymph node involvement. So we, it allows for a staging of tumors for stage two to stage three. Um, it also has data sets for uh, that are you know, expression data sets for metastatic tumors versus primary tumors. It allowed us to be able to segregate the data, to be able to focus on those primary tumors and to look at what's going on in those uh, primary tumors and assess uh, whether our genes were able to make some diagnostic uh, metrics for those. And the metric we really wanted to focus on was disease-free status. And so DFS is the time frame between when you resect a primary lesion or lymph node and the time which the, the patient uh, presents with metastatic disease. And so as we're all aware, the earlier you can detect melanoma, the better the disease prognosis. We wanted to first validate within TCGA that the expression data set, that they, they had the range of tumors to be able to discriminate um, between stage two and stage three, and that, the, that those stage two and stage three tumors did correlate with different times of disease-free status. So I plotted that here where stage two is in green, stage three is in orange, and I've plotted within that data set of primary tumors, um, both overall survival and disease-free status. So this gave us a confidence looking at this data that we should be able to discriminate uh, those tumors uh, based upon gene expression differences and they would have definite, definite disease-free status. So the approach we took was to take the 88 primary tumors that were present in TCGA and sort those tumors based on the level of gene expression for each gene being tested. And I have an example of GAP-DH here to the right. So what we're doing is we're taking the 25 highest expressing tumors for GAP-DH, plotting them in red for disease-free status, and the 25 lowest GAP-DH expressing tumors, plotting those in blue with respect to disease-free status time. And you'll see that we definitely GAP-DH, when GAP-DH is very high, individuals have a much better prognosis than for individuals and tumors who had low GAP-DH levels. So GAP-DH is a one of the 81 HIF 
direct targets. We wanted to do this for all of the other targets in our list. 80 of the 81 targets had expression data um, in, present in TCGA, so we were evaluating 80 of our 81 genes. And we found that for 10 of our HIF-1 melanocyte direct targets, that they were definitely correlated with different disease-free status based upon high expressing and low expressing tumors as the criteria. So I'd just like to note in A, those three genes, which are the angiotensin receptor, PKM, and GAP-DH, high expression of these genes in tumors have a better outcome than low expression. And this is in contrast to the other seven genes that are in our list, those are in B, where high expression of those genes in tumors was correlated with a shorter time for disease-free status. So this is really a very gene-centric view of uh, what's going on. We also wanted to take a more tumor-centric view. So what do the individual tumor profiles look like? Are, they, are we talking about the same tumors in every uh, gene plot? And so we wanted to uh, present the, the data this way. So to the left, you'll see each row is the tumor across the top or the gene expression uh, profiles for each of the 10 genes. We've clustered these genes based upon their level of expression for these 10 genes. And we've also tabulated whether um, within that tumor, that tumor was present in the data set of 25% high or 25% low. And we've plotted it relative to whether that tumor was in the better prognosis data set or the worse prognosis data set. And so the shorter disease free status is worse prognosis, and the longer disease free status is better prognosis. And we felt we were able to identify that using all 10 of the HIF1 direct targets we would have uh, the criteria, the diagnostic criteria with the area under the curve of 0.82. So we felt that this um, was a good classifier to be able to discriminate between a time of longer disease-free status or shorter disease-free status. We um, appreciate that the tumors, you know, in looking at it from this view, that the melanoma tumors, as I think we all have an appreciation for, are the expression is very dynamic. Um, but we feel that hopefully this work gives us a better understanding uh, at the cellular response to the microenvironment. Um, that in combination, adding information from the, the, the genomic side of melanoma tumors together, that we can have a better understanding of what's going on at the different distinct stages of melanoma disease progression. So, all of this work before uh, that I've described was down at, done in mass melanocytes and then converting that back over to evaluate those genes in TCGA. We did wanna go back and make sure that all of the genes that we identified behaved in the same manner in human uh, melanomas. And so we went back and revalidated all the genes that were in our uh, profile with respect to that they are definitely HIF1 responsive targets by the metrics of with uh, qPCR in each of the HIF1 knockdowns and 501 mLs. And we also did chip validation, uh, revalidating those regions uh, that we found for each of those genes in our data set. So in conclusion, I've uh, presented to you our data defining hypoxia and HIF1 dependent gene profiles in melanocytes and how the melanocytes respond to this altered uh, microenvironment state. We've established uh, using ChIP-seq a binding profile under hypoxia for HIF1 alpha, and we've identified that those peaks occur both at the transcriptional start site for genes and at distal regulatory features. And we've identified a subset of our hypoxia HIF1 dependent genes that this profile of 10 genes together is correlated with poor prognosis and reduced disease-free status. And 
I think taken together, it speaks uh, to the fact that HIF-1 really is this gatekeeper of very diverse cellular responses and that it is poised to respond to hypoxia uh, very quickly and rapidly and completely shift uh, cells response uh, to what it's expressing in response to its environment. Um, all of this work was performed in the laboratory of Dr. Bill Pavin. I'd like to thank Bill for being a very supportive mentor um, and always supporting me in letting me follow the data that I have wherever it leads. I'd also like to acknowledge the support that we get um, at NIH from the NIH Intermural Sequencing Center and our cores at the National Human Genome Research Institute, specifically the members of our microarray core and our bioinformatics and scientific pro programming core. Um, and again, this work is all published in uh, PCMR. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. And I can't wait till I'm able to talk to you all again um, in the near future.